Hi, everybody. Um, so um, today I'm going to be telling you about how dew can help plants stay in shape by essentially maintaining their water status. Um, and so the first question um, that I want to make sure oh, this is not <clears throat> sorry that I want to make sure we're all agreeing on is what exactly is dew? Um, so dew is the deposition of atmospheric water vapor onto a surface, and that surface can be a leaf, but it can be a windshield, a railing, and the reason that the water vapor is going to deposit onto that surface is because that surface is cooling to below the dew point, um, which is essentially a combination of the temperature and the relative humidity. Um, and this happens mostly in the early morning when the surface is still radiating energy, but the air itself is starting to warm up because the sun is coming out. Um, and this is different from um, fog, which is the deposition of water vapor onto particles that are in suspension in the air, for example, sea salt or soot. Um, and why I'm making the difference is because fog um, is, can be transported, and it's actually fairly rare. Whereas dew is extremely common. Um, so if you're uh, looking at this map, this is uh, coming from a model where they essentially took uh, reanalysis data, so um, relative humidity, temperature data, and they modeled how often they would be dew deposition um, in essentially the entire world. And what you can see is that there's um, the, percentage for, the potential for due deposition every single day in almost the whole world. So when they did this model, the surface they used um, is a surface that sheds um, energy very efficiently. But leaves are actually pretty close to that. Um, and so we expect that there is dew happening somewhere uh, around you um, probably almost every day. The only issue is that it's really not much water. Um, so when we look at averages over a month, for example, it's usually an order or two orders of magnitude less than whatever rainfall is bringing. And that's kind of little for, for a plant. Um, so what are the ways that plants can actually use this uh, dew water? The first one is um, stem flow. Uh, so this is just the idea that the dew droplets are going to roll down the leaf, down the petiole, all the way down to the roots, and then get uptaken back all the way up to the roots for transpiration. Um, obviously, for dew, there's usually not enough water to really have this happen in any large plant. Uh, so this is obviously for rainfall um, stem flow. But for very small plants, we can have um, this process. Um, the one mechanism that everybody is really excited about lately is foliar uptake. So the idea that some leaves can just sort of suck up the water directly. Um, we're still trying to understand how that can happen. Different species might have different ways of doing that. Um, I like this sort of hypothesis from 2004 where um, you can see hyphas that are essentially routing the dew droplets from the top of the leaf to the bottom and um, straight into the stomata. Um, and then the last mechanism is um, sort of an external way for dew to work where um, if you look at grass in the morning, uh, when there's dew on it, it's really shiny. And so if it's shiny, it means that a lot of the energy is getting reflected and it's not getting to the leaves. And that, that helps keeping them cool and remove transpiration. And then um, the evaporation of the dew droplets is an exothermic process. So that means that as the dew evaporates, it's cooling the leaf. And anything that's helped cool the leaf means that they don't have to transpire their own water to stay cool. And so I was interested in trying to understand um, between foliar uptake and this sort of transpiration suppression, um, what exactly matters the most? How does this work? Um, and to really get at this question, I used um, stable types of water. And I thought I would just give a quick overview of how we use um, water isotopes to uh, understand transpiration. So um, we have three main isotopologues of water. Um, H2O16 is obviously the very common one. It's about 98% of water on Earth is this version. Um, and then we have um, two other ones that are fairly common, H2O18 and HDO16. Um, 
and these two these two versions are um, this one has one more neutron. This has this one has two more neutrons. So they're a little bit heavier um, than the common isotope log. Um, and we're going to start having differences between uh, the proportion of these different isotope logs due to um, differences in equilibrium vapor pressure. So how easily a molecule can separate from um, the other. And obviously, if the molecule is very heavy, um, so for example, H2O18 is going to have a harder time separate. Um, and then we also have differences in diffusivity. Um, so if you have a constant energy, so a constant temperature, um, if you're heavier, then your speed has to go down, right, to um, keep the same temperature. So the diffusivity of, for example, H2O16 in the air is 1.028 times that of H2O18. And we can start picking up those differences. Um, now, um, the only issue with isotopes is that they're always given in those really weird uh, uh, units. So we actually don't look at the, the concentrations of any given isotope logs, but we're looking at the ratio of the heavy one over the common version. And if that wasn't complicated enough, we usually look at that ratio compared to the ratio of a standard, um, which is, well, I guess it's what it is. Uh, and then those numbers are very small, so they're given in per mil. Um, so um, if um, you follow what I just said, so if we have um, water that's evaporating a lot, then we're going to be losing mostly the light isotopes, and we're going to leave behind the heavy isotopes. Um, and then there's a way of actually combining both the deuterium information and the O18 information into this um, DXS um, value, which is just combining the two. And um, this gives us specifically information about evaporation because we're going to be losing the deuterium version um, of the heavy isotopes faster than we're going to be using, losing the O18 version because it's heavier. Um, and so the lower the DX's value is, the more evaporation that pool has been un, um, going through. Um, so um, I wanted to study isotopes of water in leaves, and I wanted to find a leaf that was big enough that I could sample um, a big enough piece to get the water out, but that wasn't a big proportion of the leaf. So um, this is Craig. He's perfectly normal size. Uh, <laughs> But those leaves get really, really big. Uh, they get up to a meter. So this is Colocasia esculenta. Um, taro is um, sort of the most common name. And here's an example of how we sample this leaf. So we essentially took four samples, and we kind of try to get an idea of the whole, um, the whole map of the leaf. And then we kept the other side to do sort of a bulk analysis of the water. Um, and so here are some. Uh, I'm sorry. And so what did, we, what did we do? We took two leaves, <laughs> and um, we put them under a light to increase transpiration. And one of the leaves was getting misted to um, reproduce due deposition. And the water we used was enriched in heavy isotopes. And the reason we did that is that we could essentially trace whether or not that water had gone into the leaf through foliar uptake. And so there were sort of two uh, possible results. Either the leaf that was misted was heavier in isotopes at the end of the experiment, meaning that the water had gone into the leaf, or it was the leaf that hadn't been misted that was heavier. And that would mean that it had transpired a lot more than the other one, and so the heavy isotopes were left behind inside the leaf, and the light ones um, had left through evaporation. And so here's what we get. So um, here's sort of an example. Um, on top is the control leaf, and the, the bottom is the dew misted leaf. Um, we have O18 here, deuterium, and then this sort of the excess um, value. So if we focus on the first uh, two columns, um, we can see that the control leaves has uh, much higher, um, much higher ratios of O18 and deuterium. So this uh, means that first we did not get any of our heavy uh, dew water inside of the leaf. So Colocasia scope that does not follow your uptake, which actually makes sense because it's a plant that's more for, um, that grows in very moist environments and it really wants to shed water more than it wants to uh, take it up. 
Um, but it also means that this leaf was transpiring a lot more than the one that was being misted. And we sort of double check this by combining the two isotopes, and we do get a much, um, much more negative DX's value for the control leaf than we did for the misted leaf, meaning again that indeed there was more transpiration in the control than in the misted leaf. And we can get sort of an approximation from this, um, from this value, we can approximate how much of a difference there is, and we found about 30% um, decrease in transpiration between the misted leaf and the control. Um, we then did the same experiment, but we tracked the water potential of um, the leaf. And so in white up here um, is a leaf that was uh, sort of left um, in normal condition, and then the red and the yellow, we uh, put them under a lamp to increase um, transpiration. And then here's the leaf water potential and sort of how long we left the leaf there. And what we're actually seeing is no significant difference between the leaf that had an increased transpiration rate but was misted, whereas um, the leaf that was left under the lamp without mist um, had a sharp decrease in water potential. Um, and essentially the dew treatment reduced the uh, decrease in water potential by about 64%. Um, now, the last thing I want to mention is that um, stable isotopes of water are very commonly used for foliar uptake studies. And the reason for that is that fog and dew tend to have um, an enriched uh, signal compared to rainfall. So it's a very easy way of, of uh, seeing whether or not a plant has been uptaking fog, for example. Um, and here I'm showing you just um, sort of a, a bunch of different species that people have um, looked at for foliar uptake, and this is uh, sort of the enrichment they found for, um, sorry, normalize it all. Um, and um, here is sort of the direction that uh, transpiration suppression is gonna bring your signal. And obviously if you have fog deposition and foliar uptake, you're also gonna have transpiration suppression because that leaf is wet. And um, this is not directly comparable, but we just wanna, um, mentioned that there's probably an underestimation of how much uh, foliar uptake is going on since, since your signal is actually being brought down simultaneously by transpiration suppression. Um, so this actually, uh, this study came out uh, just a couple of months ago in Ecologia, but we also did some modeling efforts where we modeled the, the um, energy, water, and carbon balances of a single leaf um, to look at how do you affect uh, this um, there's different fluxes, and we actually found a very similar uh, result than what we did for sort of this experimental setup with about a 30% decrease in transpiration um, over a day for, um, in sort of the, in the model, and this is uh, in agriculture and forest meteorology. And um, I guess I'll take questions at the break.